Let's go. Hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookshop of Worcester, and I'm here with Steve Barnes or Stephen Barnes. And uh, I, Steve, I'd like to to um, to tell for for viewers who are um, who are unfamiliar with your work, um, could, how would you describe what you write? Um, let's see. As honest as I can make it, um, as good as I can make it. Um, as entertaining as I can make it, I guess that's what I would. That's how I would describe it. If you you want something with a great a little more specificity there, so I'd say that the aspect of the sciences that I'm most interested in is human mental and physical development. I've been fascinated my whole life, and what is it that makes it possible for human beings to succeed, to thrive, survive? Um, and you know, my interest in in various disciplines, which we might or might not discuss. Uh, is directly connected to that. And so that gets expressed in my science fiction. I'm not, I'm interested in, in physics and I'm interested in, you know, in history and I'm interested, but only in terms of how does it influence what human beings are. So that has always been, you know, it's like Larry Niven specializes in astrophysics, you know, um, you know, Arthur C. Clarke specialized in astronomy. You know, I specialize in human mental and physical development. Mm -hmm. So you, basically, science fiction is your yeah. is your field. <laughs> okay, and uh, what, the science human development is the science in my science fiction. Right. Okay. And what can readers expect from your uh, newest book? Um, the most recent book was a collaboration with Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell um, called Starborn and Godsons. Um, so that what you can expect there is hopefully a, a wrap up to a saga that began, you know, 30 years ago, uh, and hopefully a good one. Uh, my, my, the solo novel before that, uh, that was the most recent, it's called 12 Days, which was a spiritual sequel to a, my fourth novel, I guess it was, uh, The Kundalini Equation. Um, which takes some of those themes and, and, and brought them more current. Um, the next thing that they'll see from me is a collection of short stories in a graphic novel format called uh, The Eightfold Path. And that will be out sometime late next year, I believe. And that is eight short stories told EC comic style, each of which represents a different step in Buddhism's Eightfold Path to Enlightenment. You know, right, wow. right thought, right action. You know, right, right livelihood, and so forth and so on. Um, and I did that with uh, Charles Johnson, who's a uh, MacArthur was a uh, National Book Award winner and uh, a Buddhist scholar, uh, among other things. He's being a great guy. Um, so you know, and then there's television stuff. I mean, I'll, I'm putting more of my attention into the visual field right now than into books. After writing 30 books. I don't get excited about a new book coming out. I mean, I, I love writing as much as I ever have, but I used to, you know, turn handsprings when I saw my name on the shelf and I don't anymore. It's like, that's nice. I kind of take that for granted, you know? Um, so I, I always try to follow enthusiasms. You know, what is the thing that turns me on? Uh, because it's easiest, the discipline of writing or any discipline in life is always a grind. There's always an element of grind in anything. Uh, and so what you do is you find the, the most interesting things about it to keep you on your edge. It's like, what can I learn? What can I do? How can I expand myself? How can I serve more people or make more money or something? So anytime I can do something new, that's one of the things that gets me excited. So television. So I did a Twilight Zone episode that came on early this year. It was my first television episode in, in uh, broadcasting in close to 20 years with in live action and you're right. it had a little bit of animation um and there's a lot of television and film stuff coming up you know i don't know how much of it'll come through but I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed and i am excited about it so that's wonderful so what do you, what do you think draws readers to um to these kinds of books and and even tv shows i mean science fiction mm -hmm. your 
But yours would be My secular. Politics, though? Well, if I was to listen to what people say, I mean, I think that the people think that I have a good hand with the writing itself, you know, the plotting and the pacing and the so forth. But I think that they do enjoy my speculations on human nature and human progression and how we heal our hearts, uh, as well as enjoying the kind of the particular type of action that I do. I, I tend to, I, I love to put uh, martial arts in my work, you know, to find some way to have a fight scene that expresses things and moves care and expresses character and moves the story forward. Um, so there are a lot of people who told me that they really enjoy that about me. So I'll, I'll believe them. <laughs> what can I say? Yeah, I spoke with Henry Lee and um, a little while back, and and he puts martial arts in his books too. Who, who is this? Henry Lee. Oh, okay. I don't know. Uh, yeah, he, he, he martial artist. Yeah, he did. No, well, he is, but he he writes um, young adult uh, oh. science fiction fantasy type cool. books. Yeah, <laughs> he puts martial arts in it. Great. You know what what uh, what art does he practice? Do you know? Um, I am not really sure, actually. Okay. Just maybe I'll meet him one day. Yeah, probably will. <laughs> he's out in the West Coast too. He's oh, okay. in he's in L.A. So yeah. <laughs> um, so what was the inspiration for your newest book? And uh, what were what were the steps that you took to bring it from initial inspiration to uh, to the finished book? Are you talking about the one with, that I did with Nivet and Pornell? Yeah, yeah your latest okay. book. Yeah. Well, the the inspiration for it was Jerry's illness. Um, uh. Yes. He, yeah, he had uh, a brain situation, and it changed his personality a little bit. He became uncertain that he could write in the way that he was used to being able to do so, and he was in deep grief about it. And mm -hmm. I realized that Larry, who is one of the people who's had the most influence on my life, was experiencing even deeper, you know, just grief, just as deep, because he and Jerry were two sides of the same coin. Um, I've worked with Larry a lot, and I love working with him, and I feel like I've had things to offer, but I could not offer the kinds of things that Jerry could. And so I decided that this amazing partnership that had not only changed the science fiction field, but had given so many people so much pleasure, and had given these two men that I owed so much too. Um, I did not want it to die without a punctuation mark to just, you know, dribble off. So I decided that maybe, maybe Jerry couldn't write anymore, but he could still edit, he could still create ideas. And given the right set of motivations, he could write some. And so I decided that I would step into the gap, that I would be the corpus callosum between the left and right sides of the brain that these guys kind of represented together. Um, and at that point, it was, let's, let's do this. Let's do this right. Let's, let's say goodbye in a real way. And so the next question was, how can we do the absolute best book possible given the limitations of the situation. So it was a juggling act in a lot of ways, but it was purely, it, the, my primary motivation was not money on this, although I love money. Um, it was love. It was respect. It was understanding that, that Jerry's from a generation where it's hard to use words to describe or convey how you feel. You know, you don't say, I love you, Jerry. You say, let's build a barn together. You know, let, let's, let's, let's make a book together. That's the kind of guy he was. And so it was my way of telling him that I loved him. Mm. What is the name of the book again? Starborn and Godsons. It's the third book, the fourth story and the third book in the Hirat trilogy. Uh, Legacy of Hirat, Beowulf's Children, and then Starborn and Godsons. It deals with a... Uh, a group of Earth colonists on on a planet dealing with the ecology and each other, and then finally in the third book with additional visitors from Earth, um, and I think that it brings the story to a good halting point. I think it brings it to a good a good close. I certainly we certainly gave it everything we have. It was it was a lot of fun to work on. It was very satisfying to work on. 
Mm -hmm. Wow. So um, what kind of research went into writing it? And um, what and what's your favorite research story? You mean the favorite story about having done research? Yeah. <laughs> well, those are two very different things. Um, yeah, we, they are actually. We brought in, we brought in uh, one of the world's top reproductive biologists, Dr. Jack Cohen from England, who had been a, an advisor on the first two books. Uh, and he right. had retired, um, but we were able to create a, uh, a, not a Zoom link, but uh, Skype. We were able to Skype Ooh. with him. Uh, bring him into our our uh, our meetings so it was like the boys were all back you know it was it was great the you know, four of us even though jack was at a distance so he provided a lot of insight into the biology of the planet um i did additional research on cave systems i did research on computers you know there were any number of different things but i can tell you that the favorite research i ever did was for a novel i wrote called iron shadows i think in which I spent a couple of years uh, researching Native American sexual magic. And we will just say that some research is definitely more interesting than others. I would imagine it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it is not a theoretical discipline. We'll just put it at that. <laughs> so what was the biggest challenge in uh, writing and putting, putting out that, um, that book? And how did you overcome that challenge? Well, the greatest challenge is being sensitive to the fact that Jerry had limitations. He's still the absolute, one of the most brilliant human beings I've ever met, and one of my favorite people, and one of the people I owe the most to. There are ways in which Jerry taught me how to think. There are ways in that. But he was limited in terms of his energy and his focus and his ability to coordinate the editor mode and the flow mode. Those things had been had been ruptured. So the biggest challenge was including, was getting the, the ideas from these two titans, the thoughts, listening to the ideas, and then implementing the book in a way that then left plenty of room for them to dive in and do their own thing, their own work. But I did not know from week to week, month to month, how much Jerry would be able to engage and therefore how much Larry would be able to engage because Larry's mood was to a certain degree dependent upon how good things were going, you know, perfectly reasonable. So it was my job to try to keep everybody's energy high, to keep things going, to keep, you know, there's always new work, there's always new writing, we're doing this. I had to be a cheerleader. I had to respect these two men understanding that this was almost a wake in some ways, as well as a celebration. It was like, we had to be realistic about, about the timeline here, that Jerry was in, in steep decline, but also optimistic about what we could do together. Mm -hmm. uh, so trying to balance those things was probably the steepest juggling act. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and what else can we expect from you in the near future? Television. You know, the, the other than the, uh, the uh, some short stories from time to time and the eight short stories that I wrote for uh, Eightfold Path, like I said, a graphic novel, I've been trying to get that going for 10 years. Um, that'll be coming out next year. I, I think that that's the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm most nervous about. And nervous is a good thing. Uh, and look forward to people reading and seeing how they, you know, what they think of it. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that they'll love it. Uh, in terms of television, there are a whole bunch of different projects. Uh, you know, one is a television series based on one of my wife's novels, uh, you know, married to the amazing Tanana Reed Du. Um, and uh, then there are other things that, that have not been announced yet, but the, the, the reformatory has been announced, so I can talk about that. Um, so I'll be working on that. I'll be working on other things as well. Um, and we'll see what comes out of this. You know, I, I've been extraordinarily fortunate in life in that um, I've been able to achieve every childhood dream that I had. And I wanted, I wanted to master writing. I wanted to master martial arts. And I wanted to have a family. A lot, you know, mastering relationships, one might say. Um, but 
if I if I say that the thing that excites me is the thing that I haven't done, then it, it is it is it actually is a challenge to ask myself, well, what's next? You know, what do I want to do? What what will bring out the best in me? And um, creating a television, I don't want I mean, writing for television. Been there, done that. It's still fun, and the money is great. But it does. It's not exciting in the same way once you've done it. You know, a dozen times. Um, so, creating a television series, I have not done, and a feature motion picture, I have not done. So, I, I, I would like very much to, to have those two things before I die. I, I would love to do those two things. That would be enormously satisfying. So, I'm probably going to be putting a lot of my energy there. Huh. So you like to do different types of things all the time, I gather. Well, I mean, there is, my life has a sameness to it. You know, I, I get up every morning. My rituals are very, you know, it, it, I do the same things every day. So human beings need both certainty and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the way to keep to do a ritual, if there's a ritual of work or of action, exercise, whatever, every day, you find something, you, you pay attention so that you see the variations or you deliberately take variations. You know, if you go for a hike every day, maybe you hike in a different place. Um, that ritual, that discipline, the capacity to resist boredom is essential to mastery. Um, most people, there's a book called Mastery written by George Leonard, who was a dense fitness editor for Esquire magazine, I believe, and also an Aikido master in Redwood City, California. And he said that the reason that most people never get really good at anything, the reason most people never master anything, is they can't handle the long periods of time where it feels like no change is being made, that no progress is being made. They can't handle the fallow periods. And it is those fallow periods in which you're unconscious mind and your nervous system is, is reworking itself, reconnecting, realigning on deep levels for higher levels of performance. If you can't survive the fallow periods, you'll never become a master. If you can't resist, if you can't resist boredom, you'll never become a master. Um, so by doing different things deliberately, I've kept myself excited about working out or or writing or parenting, you know, or too many decades, you know, wrong years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now I have some questions for you about um, on, about being a writer. Sure. Um, what's your favorite part of being a writer on the whole writing and uh, and publishing process? Brainstorming ideas and structuring ideas. You know, just before it gets to the writing, the writing itself is mostly a grind. It's a grind that I accept. It's okay. It's just part of my daily discipline. But the fun part of it, the thing that's the most fun is thinking up stories, you know, and brainstorming stories and, and, and dreaming about stories, the, the structure of them, the way the structure and the characters have to interact, that, that balance that thing, it, it's like creating a, 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 four, a higher dimensional construct in your mind. All these different things have to come together and then they all have to work together. And it's like building a, a, a music box or something like that in your head before you ever write it down. By the time I write something, I already have a structure in mind, but the structure changes as I begin to write because I begin to know the people better and the world better and they will suggest other possibilities to me. So I, I keep the basic structure in mind until I get a better idea. But the basic structure is enough that I can feel like if I can execute this, it's going to be okay. You know, I, I know how it's going to end. I've never, I don't write books without knowing how they end. I, I can't afford to spend a year of my time and end up with a piece of crap. I can't afford that. You know, uh, it would be kind of fun one day. I think that one day would be kind of interesting to, to write just the love of writing not knowing where it's going and see how that is i'm probably i've probably got the chops to do that now but i i have to admit that i'm a little too nervous to do that you know like i said can't afford to wait you find a year wasted you know well that's 500 pieces of paper i'll never see again you know i, I can't afford that um but it would be fun to try a book without anything other than an initial inspiration to see where it goes. I, 
I just, I might have to try that at some point. I might. A lot of a lot of writers do that, and uh, I know that they they're telling me that they, you know that the characters tell them where the story goes, and uh, it's very interesting. It until the characters, yeah. unless the characters get lost, I think yeah. that you look at the work itself, and if pantsing, which that is referred to, pantsers and planners, if pantsing works, then pants absolutely. If pantsing doesn't work, you don't. I mean, I've got a very specific process that I lay out that I teach students and I've taught it to, to many, many people. Uh, and it's a five or six step process uh, that is guaranteed to take you to being a published writer, pretty much. Um, and it's, you write at least a sentence every day. You finish what you write. You know, no, 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 no. You write at least one sentence every day. You write one to four short stories a month. Hmm. You finish what you write and submit it. You do not rewrite except the editorial request. You read 10 times as much as you write and you repeat this process at least 100 times before you even begin to, con begin to ask yourself if you should quit. No one has made it past 27 stories without publishing process works uh, and I have probably heard any excuse any common excuse that, that people have and I, I it's been a long time since I've heard any new excuses and the usual one is well I don't think in short stories I think in novels yeah saying that people newbies saying that they think in novels is like people who've never run around the block saying they want to run a marathon yeah bring a lunch good luck you know I've met so many people who just bombed out trying to write a novel when they did not have the basic structure of the fiction together. Um, they were setting themselves up for failure. Interesting. I, I've never heard it like that before, but it, it makes so much sense. I mean, <laughs> it's like, you know, the, the difference between publishing a short story and publishing a novel is not is nothing compared to the difference between never having written and publishing anything. Mm -hmm. So you're in the game then, and all the basic things that you need, you know, by writing a short story, all the basic stuff is there. You know, the basic structures of fiction and characterization and thematics and poetics and all this stuff, it's all there. And by compressing it down to a form that you can write in a day, conceivably, you, you're gonna learn 10 times more writing 100,000 words of short stories than you ever would by writing a 100,000 word novel. And not only that, but you're gonna, you have created a, a stair step for yourself that, that you're not investing a couple of years in writing a book and then it gets rejected and you're terrified and quit. If you write a short story and then you send it off and you're immediately working on the next story, by the time you get your rejection slip over here, you're already two stories down the road, possibly, which means that you're looking at the process of work rather than individual snapshots. An individual story is the snapshot of your process. I don't care about a student's stories. I care about their process. I know that if they will do certain things every day, day after day, day after day, day after day, that they'll get there. It's the same way as, you know, the truth about the martial arts. You know, a black belt is just a white belt who never quit. That's all, that's all it is. Um, and in so many different things, what the smartest piece of advice I think I have ever heard, arguably, I was on a science a panel of science fiction convention and we were asked what was the best advice we'd ever gotten. And the lady who was sitting two seats down from me said that she was getting her kids off to school one day and she was exhausted. They'd been, you know, just a nightmare to get off. And her next door neighbor, she lived neighbor, she lived in a duplex. The next door neighbor was, you know, on her porch. And she you know, gave her an understanding smile and she turned to the neighbor and she said, parenting is so hard sometimes. And her neighbor said, parenting isn't hard. It's just daily. Mm -hmm. See, and that's true about taking care of your body, you know, dieting and exercise. It's true about relationships. It's true about careers. In every one of these things, there is what I call an atomic minimum of things that you need to do. 
in order to achieve what you're trying to do. And you squeeze it down until it's a little thing, like just writing one sentence every day. That's a tiny thing, but it keeps the spigot open. Okay. You know, checking in with your with your loved one. You know, are, are, are we okay? Is there anything I can do to make you happy? You know, are 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 yeah. are you enjoying life? And am I being, you know, am I contributing to that? What can I do to make you happy? You know, or your child, you know, what do you need? What do you fear? Where are you going? Talking about your there's a minimum. It doesn't necessarily need to be a lot but it needs to be daily. If you can find what those minimums are and then commit to, I'm just gonna do this. This is who I am. This is what I do. If you will do that, you'll wake up after 20 years and you will have written you know, a dozen novels and you'll, have the, you know, you'll be married to somebody who you adore and you'll have the, a body that, that is analogous to the bodies that you must have. You know, that's, if that isn't success, I don't know what is. I mean, you know, the Dalai Lama says that the meaning of life is to seek joy. So you find things to do in your life that will both give you your basic requirements and also make you happy and that you actually enjoy it. So I, I said that writing, just the writing stuff is a grind. Yeah, but I take satisfaction in the grind. I take satisfaction in knowing this is who I am, that, that I promised the little boy inside me that I was going to protect him. I was going to do all in my power to create a life of meaning for him. And he's delighted with me. The little kid inside me is a happy little brat. You know, just it's, it's like he is safe. He can come up with all of his ideas. He knows that daddy would fight to the death to defend him. And he doesn't know that daddy would necessarily win, but he knows daddy would do his damage. And that's all that kids and dogs want. You know, are you there? Do you love me? Do you, you know, play ball with me? And I love you. <laughs> that's great so wh what do you think has been the greatest lesson um in your journey of being a writer so far if there was one piece of advice i would give to people is it that sort of thing yeah model excellence find someone who has already accomplished the thing you want to do preferably starting from where you started what did they do how do they use their minds? How do they use their emotions? What are the physical actions they took? What are their beliefs, their values? To the degree, it's like, it's like you know, there are a couple of different ways of baking a cake. You can just take ingredients that you hallucinate are useful and you mix them together and you leave them out in the sun or put them over a fire or whatever. And if you keep trying long enough, you'll come up with something that's kind of sort of like a cake. Or you could get a cake mix and you just pour it in the bowl, okay? And you do that. Or you could find a recipe book and you could follow the recipes. But the best thing to do is to taste a lot of cakes until you find a cake that you really like. Then you find the person who baked the cake and you pay them, if necessary, to follow them around in the kitchen for one day while they bake a cake. You notice everything they do. You video it. What do they do? What kind of eggs do they use? What kind of flour do they use? What kind of milk do they use? In what order they put it in? What's the ambient temperature and humidity? What kind of oven do they use? What temperature? To the degree that you can imitate the things that they did in the order in which they did them, in one day you can learn how to bake a cake. It took somebody else 50 years to learn how to bake. That's what you do with everything. You want to learn how to be a writer? Talk to writers. Find out how they do it, what they did. You talk to enough of them and you'll get the consistent path that works. You know, you want to be a martial artist, you talk to a bunch of martial artists, what did you do? You know, you want to, you know, to save money, you talk to somebody who started from nothing and became a millionaire. You want a healthy relationship? Don't talk to people who aren't in relationships. Talk to the people who've had healthy relationships and are still in love and they've got grandchildren that they bounce on their knee. They will give you the realistic assessment of what it takes. The people who've done it know how to do it. The people who haven't done it have opinions about it and many of those opinions will be self-justifying. I couldn't do it because of this. I couldn't do it because of that. In most cases, they're lying. They did not have the faith in themselves. They were not willing to invest themselves day after day. They let themselves get bored. They let themselves lose focus. They didn't have enough motivation to do it. And so they just came up with this, you know, you know it's like people who are in bad relations. Oh, there aren't any good women out there. There aren't any good men out there. All men are this, all women are that. No, you are not what you would need to be in order to attract the person that is in your heart. 
all you have to do is be the equal of the person that you're looking for and you'll automatically start attracting them in the process of becoming that person all you have to do is do the things that your favorite writers did you know what do all writers do all writers write they all read you know if you you know you can say anything you want to about talent but if if I hear that, Tar that Harlan Ellison was a naturally talented writer and I go to his house and his house is full of books, isn't that like hearing that somebody was a naturally talented athlete and you go to their house and it's full of exercise equipment and they're exercising all the time? Wait a minute, maybe it's not as natural as people want to think. That would be what I would, I would say, that, that modeling excellence in any arena of life is your fastest way to get there. There are a thousand ways not to get to Disneyland. There are only a couple ways to get there. Talk to people who've been there. How did you do it? They will tell you. Great. Um, all right, now I wanna uh, ask you a few things about you personally. Um, sure, go for it. Okay. I got nothing to hide. <laughs> um, what's the one thing that most people don't realize about you? My fans and the people who look at the things I've accomplished uh, and consider it to be impressive don't grasp how much fear. The fear is a constant in life. I thought that when I got, you know, my third black belt or something like this, and maybe I'd stop being afraid. No, you change your relationship with fear. The fear is always there. But see, the mistake I made was I thought that fear meant something. I thought that it meant that I couldn't or I shouldn't or I mustn't or that I was small and weak or stupid. Didn't mean any of those things. It just meant I was afraid. The fear is just a message from your subconscious to get ready to address something, to look at something that needs to be dealt with. If you learn the lesson, you can let go of the fear. If you pay attention, you don't need to be angry. You don't need to be afraid. You can let those emotions go and let's let them be what they are once you're paying attention. Accepting that I, I would always have that fear, that I would always have those doubting voices in my mind, always always set me free i didn't have to wait until i didn't wasn't afraid i didn't wait until the voices shut up it's like oh everybody's got those voices oh everybody's afraid everybody feels alone and afraid and, you know everybody feels alone and afraid and the only thing that really matters is what are you doing with your loneliness and your fear i wish that somebody had told me that i think that understanding that is if I had somebody had told me that when I was 12, life would have been, it was still would have had challenges, but they would have been different challenges. And I, I, I would not have suffered as much as I did on the way to the things that I did. Hmm. And what question do you wish interviewers would ask you and what would the answer be? What product do I wish they would go out and buy right now? <laughs> that would be either my Afrofuturism course, which is at www.afrofuturismwebinar.com, or my horror course, which is at www.sunkenplaceclass.com. Or if they're interested in personal development, it would be my course, which is designed to teach the average person the advanced thought thoughts, values, and focuses of the advanced martial artist in 10 days to get you on that road. Uh, that's the Warrior's Journey course at www.realwarriorsjourney.com. <laughs> we stop for commercial, for a station identification and a brief commercial. And that sounds good. <laughs> that's great. Anything else? Any other courses? <laughs> well, those will get you started. You know, those are the things that, you know, that, that will, will teach you the most about the Warrior's Journey course. There's a woman named Dawn Callan, who I met at a, at a week-long martial arts retreat, who could teach women how, more about how to 
find the warrior within themselves to defend themselves. She could teach them more in two days than most instructors could in two years. I was blown away by her. She's only like five foot, four foot 10. And she's just astounding. And I was the first man to sponsor her workshop because I knew that there was something magical that she was doing. And I lost track of her for almost 20 years. But then she popped up on Facebook and she was retired from her, from her teaching. And I reconnected with her and I convinced her, it took me a couple of years to do it. Will you please share with me, how do you do what you do? How could you help these women and then men? I, I was the first man to convince her to sponsor workshops for men as well. Um, Cause I just felt like what she's doing, this is what everybody needs. Um, and she finally shared it with me and we created a course. And at first it was a 10 week course uh, and I ran a bunch of people through it and I kept boiling it down. It was like, you know, 10 weeks is just the beginning. And if that's the truth, then maybe I can compress it into an even shorter period of time in terms of getting people, let me understand, once you know how to use a compass, you can find true north. You've still got to walk, but at least you're walking in the right direction. So if I can get people on the right path where they're, they understand they're getting in the right relationship with their fear, they're learning how to love themselves. And self-defense is mostly about, are you willing to fight as hard for yourself as you would to protect a helpless child? If you think about how hard you would fight to save your own child or you know, your dog or cat, if, if, if you're a cat person, how hard would you think about how you, they might drag you into court? Would you think about how it looked? Or would you think about nothing except taking their eyes out, going for it 100%? When you have... You know, a real fight is not some samurai Chimbara fantasy or Bruce Lee or rah, rah, rah. a real fight is two cats in a set. It's are you willing to go all out to protect yourself, your sacred honor and the people that you love? You do that. And then you combine that with, you know, one of my one of my instructors, you know, the smartest thing they ever told me was you're a primate, use a tool. Why am I going to hit somebody with my empty hands and feet? Are you kidding? The world is full of weapons. You know, you're surrounded by things you can hurt somebody with. Human beings are tool users. Once you have the total commitment to yourself and you understand how to adapt your environment, you become lethal. You become lethal. So that course, once you've got absolute confidence that you will do anything to protect yourself, that little kid inside you will reward you with all the creativity and aliveness that you ever wanted, all the energy. It's all there inside you once you touch the third rail of survival. You know, that, that animal thing of, you know, I will survive. You know, I have the right to be here. You will not touch me without my permission. Well, I, I, my wife, my first wife and I lost, invested $20,000 in putting every woman we knew through that workshop. We did not care if they could afford it or not. We would take a dime a week you know, to pay it off because I wanted every woman I knew to walk the street knowing that she could depend on herself, to be able to live her life without fear in that particular way. And I think we caught lightning in a bottle. Um, that, that course, it's the best thing I've ever done. And I just want to run thousands of people through it. You know, I don't even take any money from it. My partners and the business that, that sponsors it called Mastery Plus, they get their money, but all of my money goes, I give it back to the people I learned from and to support them. It's, it's not about, I make plenty of money doing other things. This is my way of saying thank you to the world for letting me, letting me be who I am, for letting me live my dreams. Oh, I can see such enthusiasm in you. It's, it's just amazing. <laughs> that's wow. what's with everybody. See, yeah. that's the thing that I'm trying to say. That what you see in me is because I'm true to the kid inside me. Mm -hmm. that, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing that little kid, that Buddha baby energy that says, earth below, heaven above, no one in the world like me. All children have that. We lose that as we get older. When we remember where we came from, that once upon a time we were all, and I mean all, loved and protected. Human children who are not loved and protected die. Now, things might have become bad or abusive later on, and the world can be terribly cruel. But if you can remember when there was someone who loved you, 
when there was someone who looked at you and saw beauty and potential, if you can connect with that and then make the commitment, I will now be my mother. I will now be my father and tell that little kid inside you, mommy's home. No one will ever hurt you again. I will work day and night, morning till, till you know, dawn till dusk, can till can't in order to create a world in which you can be happy. Once you've done that, you, you can take that energy and put it behind anything. And it's always there. It's all, we never lose it. It just, we lose it, but it's never gone. I'm just about teaching people how to get back in touch with that. You know, I'd be happy to give you a free copy of sports. Mm -hmm. Okay, excuse me for one second. Okay. Um, okay. Um, anyway, getting off on a different thing. Um, yeah. Are there any groups or clubs or organizations that you would recommend to other writers um, that have helped you in your career? Well, the science fiction writers of America are very sincere people. I wish that they were more powerful but they're a lot more powerful than having nothing. You know? and, and I think that they've accomplished a lot of good things. So I would say that you know you go to science fiction conventions, you connect with them. I would suggest connecting with Clarion. Clarion is the group. They have a history. They produce so many fine writers. The people who work for Clarion are doing it out of the love of writers. And they're experimenting more with their online presence, you know, because of COVID. So pretty soon what Clarion does will be available to anybody. But, you know, it's when I say, you know, write a sentence a day, that's keeping, that's keeping it open. That when I say write one to four short stories a month, that is so that you can work on pattern. And you're going to have to, to do a lot of study in order to do that. When I say, you know, submit it. You, in order to submit it, you need to do your market research. You're gonna learn a lot about what's out there. When I say read 10 times as much as you write, you know, I'm, that research, if you have to write one story a month, you have to read at least 10 stories a month, right? You're gonna learn, you're gonna learn, and you're gonna learn about the organizations, you're gonna learn about people, you're gonna learn about, about who's out there and what they're doing. When I say don't rewrite except to editorial request, I'm saying don't get caught up in being obsessive compulsive. You might need to learn things in order to stop being obsessive compulsive. Life, you know, life damages us. And you, you will find out where your weaknesses are by putting yourself on a righteous path. And in the process of that, you look for people who have solved these things. They're going to be in the Science Fiction Writers of America. They're going to be in Cephal. I mean, they're, they're going to be in the Writers Guild of America. They're going to be in Clarion. They're going to be at science fiction conventions and gatherings. Find those groups of people who've already done the thing that you want and others who are companions along the way and commit yourself to being one of the people who one day will be able to help others along the path. That's mastery when you can teach others along the path, when you're on the path for a lifetime, you've committed to it. I am 100% committed to being a husband and father. I'm 100% committed to being a writer. I'm 100% committed to being a martial artist. These are things that I do every day just because that's who I am. And if I don't do it, I die. You know, I'm willing to make the connection that deep. Find other people who are living their lives in the way you want to live them with joy and passion and commit yourself to being one of those people. That's, we all deserve that. The little kid inside each and every one of us deserves a mommy or daddy who will create a playground for them and stand and protect it so that they can just spend their days, these few days that we have in life fulfilling ourselves and helping others. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay, now, other, other things. Some, what are your, some of your passions when you're not writing? And how do you make time for your non-writing hobbies and things you love? Um, my, my, I've already talked about the things that are my commitment. I mean, except for the fact I love watching movies and I can camp out on my bed while I'm you know, doing you know, doing rewriting on something, you know, and just watch movies all day long or binge television. I really can't. But every day, you know, I do everything that I love every day. Okay. Um, I connect with the people that I love, my son, my wife, my, my friends. I try to talk to at least one friend every day. I'm on Facebook, you know, reminding people to take care of themselves and interact with people. I work out every day, you know, seven days a week. You know, it's just what I do. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I, I exercise, I do things to raise my energy, to protect the physical integrity of my body, to raise, to, to make my body such that it's an, it's an implement for my mind. You know, I don't want to be in the position where I know more martial arts things than I can do. You know, I am at that point in my life. I, I cannot do all the things that I know, um, but I can do most of them, you know, and I keep looking for ways. Okay, this is, aging is a little bit like making an ice sculpture in the desert. You know, every day there's a little less ice, but if you're continually working on your craft, you can still make something beautiful, you know, every day. And then eventually, of course, the sands will drink you, but that's just the game board. That's not failure. It's just, you know, the way it is. So, you know, every day I tell people I love that I love them. Every day I work out and learn something new about martial arts. Every day I absorb story and tell story. And you know, that's, you know, my life is very simple. That's it. You know, if it doesn't connect with one of those three things, I don't do it. I mean, luckily, I connect almost anything to one of those three things. <laughs> Let's go snorkeling with sharks. Sure. You know, step out of a plane. Sure. You know, you know. Yes, you're very, you're very lucky. Um, what are yeah, some I am lucky, but I'm, I'm lucky because I'm lucky because I decided pretty early in life what it was that I wanted. And then I found people along the way who were able to teach me to do it. So I don't believe in talent. I believe in hard work and honesty over time. So I decided pretty young that I wanted to be a writer. And then I just, well, what do I need to do? Mm -hmm. you know? So if you were to decide you know, that you wanted to be anything, it's a matter of finding someone who started roughly where you started and got to where it is that you want, finding out the price that they paid for it and making a decision. Are you willing to pay that price? If you are, you know, pay that price every day. And be sure that you're happy every day because tomorrow is promised to no one. So you never set out along a path that you makes you miserable now, but you're going to be happy later. You know, there are things that are that are exertion, but find a way to take joy in them, even if it's only what I call good, evil fun. You know, the I'm one of the few who's disciplined enough to do this shit. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like, yeah you know i'll take satisfaction in that not everything is fun on the surface some things are just fun you know, like the satisfaction of reading a hard book or, or writing a tough essay you know or or having a tough conversation with someone you love and you come out the other side of it all hugs and you know each other better it was tough but man that was worth it see what i'm saying <laughs> Yeah. So what does your um, writing space look like? And um, what do you need What do you need to have around you while you're writing or editing? Uh, not much. You know, I like to have, you know, I like to have a computer. Uh, but if I didn't have a computer, I could use paper. You know, I haven't written anything on paper for a long, you know, actually written anything on paper for a long time. But I use paper and three by five cards and <laughs> post-it notes and other things like that, too help express and organize my thoughts. I've got a whiteboard over there and I got an easel with a big post-it note, huge post-it note pad on it that I scribble on. I've got notes all over my office and, and you know, books, you know, over here, and stuff like this. So I do like to be surrounded by things that are sort of like my messy brain turned inside out. Uh, my office is in a finished room off the, off the bedroom, actually. It also doubles as our gymnasium. Uh, and soon it's going to it's going to double as our VR room, you know, because we got the new Oculus Quest 2. And uh, it's like, well, what's the biggest space in the house for us to play? You know, why not help me keep my office straight? And we'll make this a dedicated VR room. That's fine by me. Um, but mostly what I need is to have the inside of my head, you know, um, to be able to connect with that creative self and play with those ideas. I love that so, you know, I, I've i often told people, you know, you don't want me to write, you know, people say, well, you know, would you help me write this, help me write this? And no, you can't afford me. However, I might talk you through it just for the fun of it. Let's talk story. You know, you can't get me as a writer, you know, unless you pay Writers Guild, you know, rates, which are, but, you want to talk about a story? You want to talk about building a character? You want, like, I love that. That's like a pretty girl asking me if I want to make out. I mean, please, of course, you know, <laughs> this is what I do. You know? <laughs> so, 
So do you, do you have, um, do you need to have like certain types of food with you or um, do you no. like music or silence or? No, I mean, I, I vary. I mean, depending on what kind of writing I'm doing, you know, I will listen, to, I'll have background noise. I'll, I'll often listen to books while I'm in certain phases of writing. Um, but when I'm creating, producing, see, I will write in a couple of phases. There's the there's the planning phase during which I say, can this story work and do I believe there's a market for it? Then there's creating the rough draft phase. Sometimes there's a research phase, you know, if, if, if the story isn't based on something that I already know. Um, and then there's the polishing phase. During each of those phases, a slightly different ambiance is useful. So I can if I'm just going over manuscript and making corrections to, to, to grammar or spelling, I could be listening to a book. I'm listening to Barack Obama's autobiography about his, about his years in, the, in office right now. Um, if I'm going into flow mode, I, I might be listening to, you know, uh, some sort, you know, Beethoven or Mozart, soft jazz, something without words in it that is just... Mm -hmm carrier tone for emotion because I'll just you know roll up my eyes go into alpha visualize the scene and then type down what I see without any concern whatsoever for spelling or grammar or punctuation or anything else just as fast as I can write it the, I will go back in and correct it later probably on, a, on another day it might, might be days before I get back to that um, so I will experiment I'll tinker with that I mean every I have a discipline, one of the things in my teaching methodology is called life writing. It's, it, it applies Joseph Campbell's model of the hero's journey to planning out your own life in advance. Um, I have a thing that I call IDEA, instinctive designation of energy and attention. For every activity that a human being has, there is a perfect amount of energy and attention for doing that thing, whether it's playing with a kitten or baking biscuits or making love or dancing or going to sleep or writing or anything else. You know, you need a certain amount of relaxation, a certain amount of focus, a certain amount of excitation, a certain amount of being laid back. So every step in the writing process requires that you kind of tune your mind and your emotion to that. I think that if I were to say if there was any one thing that's most necessary, it's the ability to get into state. You know, whatever the state is in which you can write or you can read, or you can be with your family, or you can play with your dog, or you can do whatever it is that you, miss, that you need to do in life. Learn to identify the inner state that you're in that makes it most efficient and effective. Then what you have to do is learn how to, how do you get into that state? And different people do it in different ways. Some people do it with food. Some people do it with you know their place. Or the, or the music or some ritual, you know, smoke a cigarette, you know, take a drink, whatever it is they do. Find a healthy way to get into the state in which you can do the thing that then will allow you to stay on the path that will bring you closer and closer to your bliss. Okay, so all this stuff ultimately works together. Right, do you have any, um, uh, furry or feathered or otherwise uh, non-human companions that well, you will a, either have, help you. Do I have any fur babies? Yes, fur yes. babies. We have two cats, uh, oh. uh, Django and Ginger. Um, and uh, I, have, I, have, I have puppy hunger. I have not had a dog in a while because after we moved down to California from the Northwest, um, ex we haven't lived in a house where I've been able to have a dog for a while. And that's the next thing that we have to do is to move someplace where I can. And that's, you know, COVID and other factors have kind of got us sealed into where we are right now, which, you know, it's, it's safe and it works, but I do miss having a puppy. I love dogs. I love cats too. Yeah. I've had dogs, cats, parakeets, chinchillas, chickens, fish you know many different kinds of, of animals i really do love i really ants ants slime molds you know 
<laughs> I've had a lot of different kinds of, of living things that I try to take care of. And it's, it's an honor to be a safe place for an animal or a child to be in. <laughs> oh, that's great. Now, do, do they help you or hinder you in your writing at all, the cats? Well, Ginger, Ginger ignores me and runs away. You know, and he, but he's very close to my son. So he, you know, he, he's, he's good for my kids. So, you know, he's, he earns his, his, his food like that. Django, Django and Ginger will come out to my office, but Ginger will not interact with me. Django will sometimes come up and, and play with me a little bit, stand on his hind legs to be scritched. You know, they're not the most friendly animals in the world, but they were rescue animals. And I think sometimes rescue animals, if they had a hard time before they were rescued, can have some trust issues. They're closer to my wife and my son than they are to me. But Django gives me enough kitty love that I, I can feel like, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm a cat. I'm a cat owner. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> the, feline, the, the, the feline goddess does not look on me with disdain. Um, I, I would love to be closer to them, but that's their choice. I'm not going to force them to do that. But I do look forward to having another puppy. Uh, puppies are great. I, I love I love puppies. Uh, if I thought that I wasn't going to be able to have one, I would get myself a kitten and raise it so that I would have my own cat. My, my, the cats in the family belong to other members of the family more than they belong to me. But it's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So um, that's that's just about it. But except for where can uh, people find your work aside from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester? And I'm going to put a little plug in here um, for Annie's. Uh, well, I'm not going to mention any other book bookstores or 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 sites. You've been you know most most generous with your time. So I would suggest <laughs> that everyone who reads it, who who sees this, should go to Annie's or and, you know contact Annie's. Um, other than that, you can find my stuff by Googling me, you know, um, you know, I have, you know, stephenbarneslife.com. I have websites. I'm on Facebook. You know, I have a YouTube channel. I'm around, you know, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a pretty public person in that sense, but I, I wanted to say to thank you for the time and for the wonderful questions. I hope that this has been what it is that you needed. Oh, yes, it's exactly what we needed. Um, and I just wanted to let people who are watching know that uh, Annie's is at uh, 65 James Street in Worcester, Mass. And um, we um, we do uh, actually do delivery. So you can you can give us orders at orders at um, orders at Annie's books, Worcester dot com. And we will mail you out the uh, the actual the books. So, and we can get any books that you want. So any of, of Stephen's books, you know, we'll get for you. Um, yeah. So I'd like to thank you for joining us today, Stephen. And, and uh, hope to uh, hear more, more great things about you. Well, um, I hope so too. And if there's anything I can do for you in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out. Okay, then thank you very much. You're welcome. Take care. Bye. Bye.